Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Pursuit Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Engineer, and on today's episode, we have Dan and Jackie Wells, some local customers and great friends from Eastern Ohio. Dan, Jackie, and their two boys are a family who strive to live a lifestyle connected to nature, a lifestyle that they believe is what got us to where we are today, the lifestyle that our ancestors lived. We discuss how they got started in hunting and trapping, raising their children in the outdoors, the differences between hunting and fishing in Florida and Ohio, and of course, their dog Boone. Please welcome Dan and Jackie Wells. Okay, we're recording. We're recording. All right, cool. All right, everyone. Welcome back. Like I just mentioned in the intro, we are here today in our studio with Dan and Jackie Wells. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. Doing well. Good to be here. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. So they are a family that um, wild game, basically wild game is your thing, right? Every meal, big hunters, big trappers. So we're going to have them talk about, you know, their family and and how they, uh, you know, catch, catch, excuse me, how they hunt for their meat and, um, and yeah, it's would be a good, great conversation. Hey, we today. catch some of our meat too. Uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Above that. Well, there we go. Yeah, you do have a fishing hat on, so there we go. <laughs> that's, that's, right. that's perfect. And you guys have a vegetable garden stuff too, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's been a big. Uh, you know, really, the hunting was easier to get into when we moved uh, back to Ohio, and the uh, the garden was uh, a little bit bigger of an undertaking than. Than, than getting into the woods so That's we can awesome. we can talk a little bit about that but i love the home style life so uh well yeah let's just get right into it so let's talk about your history where you guys are from and kind of what got you started into you know procuring your own meat and vegetables and, and being self-sustaining you go ahead you go ahead jack yeah <laughs> okay. i love it i was born um in ohio and i've lived throughout central ohio and uh southern ohio but uh, my family is not a family of hunters. Um, I never would have even thought to hunt until I was an adult. Um, so I, I've only been hunting for about seven years. My, my son was born, and then when he was about one years old, that's when I first went out to go hunting, and um, I just fell in love with it. Um, I, I remember going out with Dan, and we weren't actually hunting. We were just going out as a, on a date just to watch just to look and see yes guys i am a romantic no he's so romantic <laughs> <Nothing more> romantic. <laughs> let's go out into the woods i even had, I just had surgery on my foot so it was interesting climbing a tree stand but oh, you're in a boot weren't you yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah but um i just i fell in love with just being outdoors i i didn't grow up being outdoors much um i mean i went camping like once a year and i think i remember going fishing at a family reunion one time but that's about it. Yeah, so right. I really didn't have any of that. But um, did you catch any fish? I did actually. I was <laughs> I, I was uh, the biggest catcher of the group. <laughs> it was there just me go. and my two brothers. But <laughs> perfect. Good deal. Yeah. So uh, very very similar uh, experience to Jackie. Of course, uh, grew up. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Grove City, okay. and. Um, growing up, we were, we were always outside, uh, whether it was my brother and I playing in the Creek, uh, in the neighborhood. The creek or Crick? It well, see, I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm a Creeker, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Depends well, if it has a tire in it, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now my dad, he'll say Crick all day long. Uh, but we were play, we'd play in the Creek. I was in Boy Scouts and, you know, learned, uh, you know, basic outdoor skills and, and bushcraft, but, Hunting was really never a part of my upbringing. Every once in a while, uh, we would shoot some small game, you know, squirrels, rabbits. I, I think one year, a distinct childhood memory, uh, my dad killed a, uh, a rabbit on Easter Sunday. So uh, my dad killed the Easter bunny. <laughs> and I just, that, that's just burned into my... Way to go, dad. Memory, <laughs> that's right. Uh, but of course, um, you know, hunting and really providing our own uh, meat was really never a part of, of our experience. And when uh, we moved to, when Jackie and I moved to Kentucky, when we got married in 2009, there was just something 
uh, we, were, we were outside a lot, but there was something that was just kind of drawing us to explore and to seek out like a deeper connection. Uh, not only a deeper connection to the land, but to where our food came from and the ecosystems that we inhabited. And uh, my introduction to hunting then came from uh, a guy named Randy. And I still don't know Randy's last name. <laughs> and, uh, but but uh, that introduction was uh, him calling me up one day and was like, hey, Dan, uh, do you want to go coon hunting? I've got some uh, champion coon dogs and we're going to run those coon dogs. And I was, I'm like, yeah, let's go. When do you want, when do you want to go? And he's like, well, uh, meet me at midnight. And I'm like, hold on a second. Buddy. What's <laughs> going on here? So we got together at uh, midnight and ran those dogs until the, uh, till the sun came up. And that just kind of sparked a, a passion and uh, to, to just be out in the woods, to, to hunt and to be connected to the land. And the rest is history. And now it is uh, just a deep part of, who Jack and I are. We've got two boys. Their name's Thomas and Lincoln. And everything we do is uh, in some fashion connected to the land uh, and then the community that we find in the midst of those pursuits. So you're in, you're in Dresden. So those of you that are familiar with this would be more East Central, if you will. I'd say East, East Ohio. And you mentioned the vegetable garden. And you came back up from Florida and then that's the easiest way that you kind of have, what, what kind of size are we look, talking about? What, what all are you growing in there? Yeah. So, um, really we, we haven't, um, in, in, in our, in our cultivation of, of a garden, um, we're kind of we're really in our, we, we've been in Dresden for a year and a half and just this spring will we have the opportunity to really build that out. So when we were living in Florida, we lived in Florida from, 2013 to 2020, we moved to Ohio uh, in spring of 2020, and we maintained an acre and a half garden while we were down there in Florida. And we lived on 12 acres, and um, of that 12 acres, uh, four of it was planted pines. Uh, about a, an acre and a half, two acres was, uh, you know, kind of our residential property. And then we had uh, the rest of it as pasture land. And uh, we made the decision, Jackie and I, that there was a, a deep need in the community to provide healthy, sustainable, fresh food, uh, especially in uh, a rural area such as uh, the one we lived in. We, you know, usually when you think of Florida, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you guys? Okeechobee. Yeah, the, the fish are over here. Oak, angler. <laughs> Oak Oak I mean, yeah, your, your beaches, your sandiness, yeah, yeah. your cypress swamps, that kind of thing. Right, yeah. that's right. You think of, you know, sandy beaches, you know, the, the bass fishing down in Okeechobee, uh, or like Florida Man headlines. I'm a big fan of Florida yeah. Man headlines, yeah. right? Uh, but where we lived, it was it's, it's ultimately as deep as you can get in the deep south, uh, south Georgia, south Alabama. And we lived in one of the largest geographical counties in the state of Florida, but it was the smallest populated county in the state of Florida. And with that, there was extreme poverty in the area. And so one of the ways that we thought we could help that community was making a community garden available. And so in, in that effort, uh, I learned from, uh, well, both Jackie and I learned from a, uh, an old farmer named Walter Joyner. And Walter kind of taught us how to farm, really farm sand, uh, yeah. because the, yeah. the, 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 the soil quality was so poor down there. And then it really just became a part of our lifestyle and that we were growing food, not just for uh, our family, but for, uh, for our community. And we saw in the midst of that how many friends we were able to make and how many opportunities that opened for us to, to not only share food and gather around our neighbors' tables, but uh, through that community garden, it also opened up a bunch of hunting opportunities because here was somebody who uh, they didn't know how to grow their own food, but they could come and get corn and beans and squash and uh, potatoes. And they said, well, hey, uh, have you ever hunted before? And I'm like, well, I, you know what? Uh, say no more. Uh, I'll have a tree stand up there <laughs> tomorrow. So, yes. uh, so that was really our inter introduction. And, uh, you know, since so much has been you know, really moving really fast in the last year and a half. It's just now in the spring that we'll really be able to to ramp up our, our garden. So we're making making those plans now. And since we do live in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, what we're learning now is, you know, how do you 
how do you plant a garden on the side of a hill? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our house yeah. is on a pretty steep hill, so it's interesting to try to learn new things. Sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I tried to do the same thing last year with the whole sustainability and homesteading and what have you. And I got a little ambitious myself and <laughs> but it was on you know that sleep hill well of course rain well guess what happened wash out and you know you're experiencing those issues and you know obviously um you know the rabbits or deer or anything like that that you'd have that come and eat so there's definitely a whole nother challenge to that as well let's get into i i, I'm, I have two kids myself two small you know two smaller children i want to get into uh kind of your thoughts behind getting them more involved and and then for those people that are listening to this, like myself, who also have children, and maybe they want to get them off the tablet, get them off the YouTube or the, you know, the the games, like maybe some advice that you'd have for, for families like that to kind of help as a family get out more and do that kind of thing. Sure. I, I actually was just asked um, last, last a couple months ago for by my cousin, he, he was talking about how he admires everything he sees of uh, of us on Instagram. He lives a little bit away from us, but, um, he said, I can't get my kids to go outside. And I said, well, do you go outside? Sure. And he said, do I have to? I said, well, if you want your kids to go outside, <laughs> well, yeah, you have to go yeah. outside. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if you want to get your kids involved in, in what you're doing and involved in the important aspects of, of who you are as a family, then, you know, you have to First of all, you have to be that example for them, yeah. and you have to just bring them along with you. And um, you know, sometimes we take our kids out, and they don't want to go. And then when they get out there, they have a blast. Sure. Um, so it's you know, it's just kind of one of those things where you have to um, just instill in them that it's an important part of your life. It's good for you. It's you know, it's healthy to get outside, and um, it's fun. Um, so we, we also kind of instill in them, you know, like a lot of people will say, well, you have to do your chores because you live in this house and this is, you know, you're, you're a part of this family, so you have to help out. Well, that's also in our family, that's helping out with getting food, um, you know, helping out with going out into the woods and, um, whether that be, you know, helping us get the beaver out of the trap or, um, going turkey hunting or deer hunting or whatever it might be, um, they, they are, a, that's part of, part of our family life. And it's yeah. just kind of something they've always known. But if you haven't always done that with your children, it's not impossible. You know, you can still do it. Um, and, and as you learn to go out and learn new things, you just kind of make sure that it's a family event. Yeah, you got to make it fun for them, right? You know, just like I was telling Ben, my daughter and I went shed hunting last week. I wanted darn well. They're, with a five-year-old, I'm not going to find a shed with her. I mean, maybe, but the the chances are pretty low. But we were able to spend, you know, an hour outside with lots each other. Lots of snacks. Lots of snacks, thing. exactly. <laughs> My, don't don't yeah. bring rock candy, whatever you do. Yeah, <laughs> I learned, I learned don't do that. rock candy. Don't no do rock. M&Ms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If but, you need it to be quiet. <laughs> but it's like, you know, make it fun for them too, right? I mean, you guys are in a unique situation where that that that's your whole, you know, that's your life. That's how you're raising yourself. That's how you're feeding your family. So obviously, you know, getting them to, to, to understand that and to, you know, hold their weight, if you will, is different. But, I mean, if someone's just starting out, you know, just make it fun. Have them come out with you. Again, you have to be outside for them to want to go outside. If you're sitting on your couch on your phone, they're going to model your behavior well, and that's that's such a good uh, an important point. Like for our boys, they've never known anything different, right? So, I mean, I had my boys as soon as they could walk, they were in a blind or climbing a tree stand. I mean, uh, the the type of I mean, they don't make tree stand harnesses for as small as they are. So I was putting together a bunch of like child size climbing equipment yeah. in order to uh, safely harness them in the tree stand. And so they always they they've always known that. You know, this is something fun that we can do together, but has real life impact on who we are as a family. Like yeah. it, they, they recognize that like, hey, I played a part in feeding our family, whether that was helping mom and dad uh, skin a deer or yeah. helping us uh, process the meat in our kitchen or, um, you know, pulling in a catfish off a trot line. Sure. They're, they're, they've been a part of it 
from the beginning. However, to say that then, we're not immune from those same sure. things that like every kid wants to do, right? They want to spend time on their tablet. Uh, they want to play the Xbox. And, um, you know, so we limit our kids' time with, time with that. But a, as you pointed out, you have to make it fun and, uh, you know, recognize too that having them out there while it does radically decrease your chances of of getting game right especially if you're engaged in like something that requires you to be still or something that requires you to be quiet uh your odds go down significantly yeah. but i i'm convinced that the effort that you put in there and the opportunities that you might miss having them out there far surpass um yeah, I mean the, the the gain that you 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 receive from that, and just building a relationship with your kids and instilling them in them a love for the outdoors. I mean, I think is is unmatched. Uh, and with our boys, I mean, I've gone out uh, ahead of time and you know planted things for them to find. Right. Sure. So uh, you know, I've got I've got like an old deer antler from the garage that I've taken out there, stashed away behind like a stump. And then when we finished our our hunt for the day, I'm like, hey, let's just look around. And the next thing you know, they're carrying uh, an antler home, and they burst through the door to show mama, and yeah. they're just beaming yeah, with pride. Yeah. And then, and then I think you know, as they you know, as they get older, they they begin to, you know, take more ownership of it. I mean, uh, about three quarters of the way through whitetail season this year, uh, our son Thomas, who's eight years old. Uh, he had become so confident because you know what he was the only one who had killed a deer, so he killed a dandy of a buck uh, during gu- the first the, the first day of uh, of youth season, and so from then it was like, well, Dad, I guess I'm the only one providing for <laughs> yeah. the family this season. So you know, it's all just it. just getting them out there and providing them with uh, opportunities to do things that are fun and enjoyable, uh, and in many ways, I, I think kids thrive when they are challenged to do difficult things uh, and when they're when they're made to build grit and determination and to really get comfortable being uncomfortable I mean this this past Monday the boys were off school and so we uh, you know we took them rabbit hunting and uh, you know they had the same complaints that any kid would when they're out there you know I'm tired I'm hungry but man, as soon as the guns started so, opening yep, up and yep. rabbits were uh, in the game pouches, their their demeanor completely changed, uh, and it was just an enjoyable experience to have the whole family out there and hear the beagles running. And uh, we did it with friends, and you know, it was just gosh, it was it was a great time and just making it enjoyable. And then two, if you're going to introduce your kids and they haven't been around. Uh, these outdoor pursuits, pick outdoor pursuits that allow them to be social, right? So, you know, if if your child, uh, if you're struggling to get your child off the Xbox or off the the tablet, um, asking them to sit for four hours in a tree stand or a blind is probably not a good idea. So take them squirrel hunting, or uh, if you if you got an opportunity to uh, get out in a dove field to shoot dove, um, you know, or, or run some rabbits, yeah. or, or just get out and and get out in the woods and and walk and uh, play some games while you're out there. I mean, I think that's the biggest way to get them involved. Just make it exciting and uh, and social for them. I'll say if the, if you have younger children and you're concerned about safety, because you know some of the things we do out in the woods, they're not super safe for like a one year old or whatever. One thing that we used all the time was just toy knives and toy guns because the kids were able to feel like they were still helping, yeah. feel like they were still a part, you know, and they, our boys would go up while we were, you know, skinning out a deer and they would use their toy knives and just try to chop its leg off with it, yeah. you know, like whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever they felt like they needed to do in order to help the process along. Um, but they would use, you know, their toys until they were able to uh, graduate to yeah. a, an actual tool. And then at the same time, you're able to use that opportunity to teach them the safety procedures. You know, hey, don't point your barrel at any person. Make sure it's down to the ground or whatever. Your BB gun should not be used as a hatchet in a briar patch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those are, that's a literal <laughs> sentence I spoke for the past <laughs> That's fantastic. 
Um, but it just it gives you an opportunity to teach those and instill those things into your children at the same time as making it fun for them yeah. and making them feel like they are still, you know, a part of the adult part of what's sure. going on. Well, I think having them in the kitchen helped a lot too, because it wasn't that they recognized that what we were, what we were doing was not, was not a sport. Um, it wasn't really even like a, something we were passionate about. It was very much a part of like our lifestyle and who we were. So, you know, to have two young boys in the kitchen cutting up meat or stuffing meat into a, uh, a sausage grinder, I think they recognize the importance of that connection that, hey, we had an opportunity to contribute something to our family. And I think that really helped them make the connection. Uh, I mean, I know if, if they were here today, uh, they would have loved to have brought, you know, summer sausage and breakfast sausage that they made. And then they could tell you the story about, you know, how they process that game. Because, you know, at our house, we don't, we don't take our meat to a processor and, and not everybody has that luxury. Uh, we have the, the space and, and the equipment to do so. But I think getting your kids involved in the processing of the game was something huge for us that I think really took their involvement to the next level. To echo Jackie's point too, um, and my wife's grandma, she'll hear this, but they took our kids, she, they, she watches our kids every, you know, once a week. And she thought it was funny, and she thought I would have a thought about it, but she took my youngest son, who's two, fishing at her pond. Well, he had no reel, or no no line, no hook, literally just a blank fishing pole. But well, guess what story, story I heard as soon as I went, I went fishing, I went fishing. I told you this story, Ben. Mm-hmm. I mean, Reagan had, she had a line, but nothing, my daughter. It was just like, but they went fishing. Now, they're equally as successful as I am when I <laughs> fish that pond, too. But... To them, like like you said, like this toy, you know, toys or make them feel included. At the end of the day, I feel like kids just want to feel like they're included in something. Yeah. And I think that that was huge. Um, I know we want to get into it. Ben and I are super passionate about your guys' food prep and taking care of everything yourself. So I, let's get really into the weeds when it comes to how much, how, real fa- on top of your head, how much food do you consume in a yearly basis that is from your hands? Not from like wild a wild game. Do you buy game. any food from the supermarket? When's the last time we've purchased meat? We've not purchased red meat from the supermarket market in seven years. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Or any butcher. Like we've not purchased no. any, any meat in seven um, years. We, we, we'll, we'll buy chicken because we don't have any chickens anymore. But um, I miss our Florida chicken. <laughs> So we'll buy chicken from the from the grocery if we if we need to. But sure. um, and then we you know occasionally there's some some produce that we obviously we don't yeah. we don't grow. Sure, yeah. But um, but when it comes to meat, we we have not bought any red meat in the last seven years. Yeah, you know, we st- we stay pretty pretty regular on a steady diet of venison, uh, wild feral hog uh, that we get from friends down in Florida. So, yeah. uh, in fact, um, the, the end of March, beginning of April, going down to Turkey hunt, Georgia, Alabama, North Florida. And then while we're down there, we'll kill a few hogs to package up, bring home and feed us through the year. Uh, so venison, um, wild hog, I'll kill, uh, as many Turkey as I'm legally allowed to squirrel, rabbit, raccoon, beaver, yeah, we, we eat rac- we do eat raccoon. That's fantastic. We do eat uh, we do eat beaver. We've got a rule in our in our home that if you kill it, you have, you to, eat have it. to eat it. Now, have you tried beaver tail, the meat eater so, beaver you know, tail yeah, recipe? So I, I've I'm heard always of this interested about and, that. And um, we usually give it to our dog. <laughs> we do <laughs> give it to our dog because we tried it. We just sure. you know, we roasted it. Yeah. And then peeled back its scales. Sure. And then I I immediately it, it immediately made sense why that was a dish that like the 19th century mountain men yeah. enjoyed because it's, it's pure fat, yeah, right? And so if you've ever had like a real fatty steak, it tastes eerily similar to a fatty piece of steak. Yeah, okay, okay. And then, of well, course, like... Well, it makes like, sense for, yeah. you know, for, for them at the yeah. time. Yeah, they needed that nutrient. That's right, yeah. So they're, they're fat-starved, uh, you know, off on the frontier. And so I can very well see why a beaver tail would be a delicacy. But now our mountain feist boon... Yeah. That is his delicacy. <laughs> there you go. That's the TL. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, you said, you know, Boone is the mountain feist. Did you guys look at, at him specifically for squirrel, or is he 
I mean, we kind of talked about it before the podcast. Ben, but ben loves him a mountain bike. Oh, I, I want a squirrel dog bad. Oh, well, we, well, we need to talk on where you can get just really the, good the prime time mountain feist. Jackie, why don't you tell us how we tell us how we got to the breed mountain feist? Because it was it was not our first choice, but we we brought Boone home out of necessity. Yeah. So we've always wanted a dog, um, and we always wanted a dog that could work. Uh, we weren't going to get a dog that just sat around. Um, but we have the issue of um, some pretty severe allergies in our house. Okay. Um, so I, I'm pretty allergic to most dogs. Um, and then our oldest son is very allergic to all dogs. We've tried um, pretty much every hypoallergenic dog that we could think oh, of, yeah. and he's still allergic to all of them. Bummer. And um, No, he's not allergic to, like, any wild game. No, he's not <laughs> allergic the, to any wild game. That's I, Yeah, he... he but he's anyway, fine sorry. with everything else. But um, so we were kind of came to the conclusion that we were just never going to be able to have a dog. Uh, and so we were um, actually at a, a hunt camp in Alabama with some friends of ours, and they brought their mountain feist. And they were there. We were there for a couple days, and our boys played with that dog, and that dog sat on their laps, oddly enough. Um, Licked them in the face. <laughs> yeah, all uh, for, for three days straight, and they didn't have one issue. I didn't have to give them yeah. allergy medicine That's wild. at all, um, which is really strange because they should be allergic to him yeah. because he's not a hypoallergenic dog. Um, and so we about a year after that, we were discussing dogs again, and um, I told Dan, I said, well, if we want to try – to get a dog, we have to get a mountain feist, and it has to be from the same breeder that that dog came from. Sure. Um, that Razor. A week later, I had him in the house. <laughs> yeah, his name, his name no was more. Razor. So Say he no said, said figure, out, figure out the breeder <laughs> that Razor came from, and we can do that. And um, and luckily, you know, mountain feists aren't aren't like you know three thousand dollar dogs. Mm, yeah. Um, so we were able to kind of say, well, if it doesn't work, it's not like we're out that much money. Sure. Um, and it and it turned out to be great. He he lives in the garage most of the time. I haven't let him stay in the house very much because I'm still a little alert, a little nervous about yeah. it. Um, but living outside and staying outside and being um, you know a part of our family that way has worked out wonderfully. Yeah. So once we recognize, like, hey, this might be the only breed of dog that works for our family, you know, I started researching, okay, you know, what, what is the mountain feist and what can it do? And, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're bred in central to South Appalachia. And these dogs were originally bred as, you know, varmint dogs. And now they're used today as squirrel dogs. And, um, we got ours from a great guy named Mark in, uh, Whitwell, Tennessee, uh, at Crossfire Kennels, and uh, our dog comes from a, a line of champion squirrel dogs in the American Treen Feist Association. Uh, and so I started, I started, you know, researching the Mountain Feist, and you know, obviously most people are using them to uh, to to run squir- to tree squirrels. Now, um, I'm, I'm a trained historian, so I, I have my PhD in history, and. I began to do like a deep dive on feists and come to find out that like historically these dogs were used in, you know, rural Appalachian regions for families who quite frankly couldn't financially support a larger hunting and working dog, right? Because they're small, they're smaller dogs. Uh, The biggest they'll get is 30 pounds. Uh, And so, you know, 150 years ago, these mountain feists were used to not only tree squirrels, but to tree raccoons, to flush birds, uh, to trail um, wounded deer, uh, really as a, as like a, a versatile hunting dog. And so we found, you know, we, we found that breeder from, uh, from Razor. Our friend uh, Harold had Razor, and the boys really enjoyed him. And we brought him home, and we've put him on everything since the day he arrived uh, back in Dresden, Ohio. We've had him. He's treed squirrels. Uh, he's treed raccoons. He's trailed deer that I didn't think we would. I would have never recovered if we didn't have him. Uh, 
he's not a big fan of rabbits. I've had him around a bunch of rabbit dogs, and he just kind of sticks around and, and hangs out. Uh, so he doesn't really have the drive for rabbits. But uh, he's just an awesome, awesome little guy. He's only five months old and smart, super obedient when he wants to be. He's still got that, that puppy disobedience in him. But we, we, take, him, we take him everywhere, and uh, he'll, even, he'll even retrieve ducks. Uh, I've seen, seen him retrieve ducks. He'll go after, he'll go after geese. Uh, I shot, I, actually, I shot a, uh, a few geese the last day of, uh, of goose season this year. And uh, one of them was banded, and Boone jumped right off into the creek where we shot him. And I'm like, buddy, that goose is two times bigger than you. But he tried and tried and tried, and eventually I had to, uh, uh, to put a stop to that <laughs> because I didn't want him to, to drift off under the ice. But he's an, he's an awesome dog, uh, mountain feist. And, of course, there's a, a debate about the difference between a, a mountain feist and a, a tree and feist, but – they're really the same. It just depends on what region you're in. Sounds like he's the perfect dog for you guys. Oh man, yeah. You looked into it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he's, no. He is. He is great. And we feed we feed him uh, a, a raw diet. So uh, he is a big fan of of uh, venison scraps. You know, when we're when we're trimming, uh, he loves uh, organ meat, and uh, he really just he really fits into the. Uh, to the, to the family, and he's everywhere with us. We thought about bringing him today. <laughs> That's awesome. He would have been welcome right <laughs> all, for sure. For sure. I've been looking at the the cur over the feist, but really it's just I can't even have a dog right now because I live in an apartment, so it's just one of those things like later on when I have my own place – I will have a, a squirrel dog. Yeah, and that's one that's one thing. I mean, that's how you really train a squirrel dog is just getting them into the woods. Yeah, you have uh, to spend a lot of time in the woods. Yeah, you're going to burn up a lot of boots training a squirrel dog because I think, you know, 90% of a good hunting dog, whether it's a squirrel dog or a bird dog or whatever type of working dog, 90% of it is whether or not they come from good genetics. And uh, you can just really help your your gun dog train themselves and really kind of tap into their genetic potential by just getting it out in the woods and getting exposed and socialized and uh, really helping it find that that drive to uh, to find fur and game and to really please please the owner. So I, I kind of want to dive back into the difference between I mean I we talked about it at women keeping it wild a little bit the difference between hunting and fishing etc in Florida as opposed to hunting and fishing in Ohio. Not to hurt Florida fans. <laughs> we, I mean, everybody. If Florida's great, but we, I just want to talk about the differences a little bit. Well, I was just telling you right before we came in here that I've had, in the year and a half that we've been back in Ohio, I've had um, an issue transitioning my brain uh, because, at least with, with whitetail hunting, I was – I was able to take more uh, because of rules and regulations in Florida uh, during a season. And so, you know, you saw something and it looked like a, something great, then, you, you know, you would take it. And um, and in Florida, you need – they're smaller, so you need more of them sure. to feed the family for the full year. And so you're just kind of trying to, to make sure you have enough. And um, and then now in Ohio, you, you have the limit uh, – in our county, we have a limit of two – um, Which is being changed. It's proposed that they're going to a three deer county in this next year. Yeah, that'd we'll be, actually talk to the program great. director about that next week. But there's no so. deer in Muskingum County. It's no. a terrible place to live, <laughs> yeah. a terrible place to hunt. Especially near that public land near Dresden. Don't, don't, don't go, visit it. No, yeah, yeah, don't, don't go don't, there. Don't go, don't go there. So I find myself passing on a lot more, especially in the beginning of the season. And I'll see something that, you know, by the end of the season, I'm like, oh, that would have been – I shouldn't have passed on that. That was silly. Yeah. Um and so then you feel the pressure at the end of the season. So that's one of the biggest changes that I have noticed is that, you know, it's just kind of a trying to figure out for myself what, um, you know, my limit is on what's worthy of, of um, taking here in Ohio. And you want to maximize that opportunity. Right, exactly. Get that little voice in your head like, well, that one's all right, but maybe the next one might be yeah. way bigger. Well, and the, the first time Jackie sat a stand in Ohio, she sent me a picture mid-hunt. She's like, a nice-sized doe just came in through this little pinch point. Uh, and <laughs> I had to respond because I said, Jackie, 
that's got to be a yearling or a fawn. <laughs> she recognized so it was because the yearling or fawn was about the same size as like a fully mature doe yeah. in Florida. Yeah. Would you say would you say the deer in Ohio tastes better than the deer in Florida? I mean, because I'm a meat I'm a meat hunter, and that's what I'm hunting for. Is yeah. because steak ain't cheap, right? <laughs> no, I, and I, I think I think I think Ohio deer taste significantly better. I the think they get better Florida. nutrition, obviously. Yeah. Um, what so. do they mainly browse on down there? There isn't. Is there a whole lot of master? I mean, I, I mean, really. Uh, well, let's just say in the area that you live, is there a ton of master? Like, what are they browsing on down there? Sagebrush. Okay. And uh, the plethora of corn feeders that yeah. are scattered throughout yeah, the, it's a lot the of landscape. Corn. <laughs> yeah, well, it, but not planted corn. No. So they're not going to a corn field. They're just going to the massive deer feeders that are that are everywhere. Yeah, uh, they'll eat like palmetto berries, like yeah, off the, uh, the pal- palmetto beds. Uh, good spot to find a rattlesnake. Great spot to hide for turkey. Uh, so that's and and I think that one thing I've preferred about whitetail hunting here in Ohio is I've noticed, especially like the mature the mature bucks, are more receptive to calling and vocalization that's so true down in florida you could not i mean you could not call them you couldn't rattle them in and so up here it's really worked to to our advantage the uh the buck that i killed two seasons ago uh the buck that my son killed this past season which was his first ohio buck uh we rattled both of those in you know peak rut and that really you, that would have never happened in florida uh now fishing on the other hand, uh, as much as I'll say that Ohio has the upper hand on whitetail all day long, right? And I don't think there's a single Floridian who would admit, uh, who, who would make the claim that, that Florida whitetail hunting is better than Ohio whitetail hunting. The, F- the Florida fishing... is so much better. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> gosh. Yeah. So much better. But, and that's both saltwater and, yeah. and freshwater. I know my favorite fish is saltwater fish, so... Yeah, I really miss that uh, being up here. But, but I'm personally not a very good fisherman. Um, so I'm one of those people that I'm like, let's get in the boat and let's go put some trot lines out and some limb lines and. Um, Translation: She is country as they come. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not real great with a um, with a fishing pole. But <laughs> Hank, Hank Jr. would be proud. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, no, that was one thing that was nice about where we were in Florida is that. Uh, you know, we were a 45-minute drive from the coast where we could fish the uh, the grass flats for uh, speckled trout, um, redfish. Um, we could go surf fish and catch pompano, whiting, black drum. Uh, yet we that was lived... fun with kids too because they oh, could yeah. play on the beach, oh, and I, then I when yeah. action happens, then they get to run up and See take care up. of it. But then it's not the in between is not super boring. Yeah, well, and then we lived right. We lived right off of Lake Talquin, and Lake Talquin had, uh, I mean, not as good as not as good as fishing as, um, you know, Okeechobee or Lake Seminole. But I mean, you'd have to really work hard to not catch bass on Lake Talquin. Uh, but you come up here to Ohio, and it's really it's been a struggle for us to kind of figure out figure out the the angling other than running the trot lines and bush hooks on the muddy Muskingum. I mean, you, you, but you can't even taste the contaminants. <laughs> not, <laughs> doing fine. not too bad. I know Florida is a dream trip for me. Like, I'd love to go out there and fly fish for redfish. Oh, yeah. listen, just we say the word. I'll, I'll put you on them. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna share my spot because that, that was one thing we we had even we had gotten. Jackie and I had gotten to the point where we were able to spend so much time hunting and fishing. Even locals who had lived their entire life. They had never gone and fished the grass flats, and they would come to me asking for my spots. And even as I moved away, they're like, hey, hook us up on your redfish spot. Because we'd go out every time we'd go out red fishing, we'd come back. That was always our, our date in Florida. We'd go redfish oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fishing. <laughs> well, and so in, you know, on the onset uh, of the onset of the, the pandemic in, in 2020, uh, I was teaching at Florida State University. And because of the financial uncertainty, uh, my position there was eliminated. 
And so in order to kind of uh, explore options to be able to provide our family, uh, I had applied for uh, my Florida guide license. And we were all set, ready to, uh, you know, put the, uh, the vinyl wrap on our boat. And I was going to guide, uh, you know, guide hog hunts and uh, fishing tours. Uh, and then we made the decision to move to Ohio and don't regret that decision as well. But uh, Florida, Florida was great. Still trying to figure out the, uh, the fishing here in the, the great Buckeye state. Yeah. We know some guys. Yeah, okay. definitely. We can help you out. I want to get him and Brian together. Yeah, it'd be fun. Him and Brian together and do some creek stuff and some river stuff. That would be yeah. a blast. And that we know a fun. couple guys that are really good at grabbing crappie. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. You know, walleye. and. Now, we've, we've gotten into the crappie pretty well. Uh, we, we've done pretty well in the crappie fishing. Um, you know, obviously, you know, catfishing isn't, uh, you know, you, you've heard, you know, fly fishing for trout is like, high church and if fishing were considered a religion i don't know what running uh trot lines and bush hooks is uh <laughs> in terms of your religious experience uh but count me that that's my religion sure right? yeah that's fantastic <laughs> so that'd be great hey, there's nothing wrong with catfish i love catfish no it's great food well the one thing that why i'm really interested in one thing i know absolutely nothing about is trapping mm -hmm. and i know we're really interested i mean I know Ben's extremely interested. Well, I was telling Jordan we talked on Instagram. Yeah. This place has been trapped out since, yes. you know. <laughs> That's right. And I was Which, like, yeah. Jeremiah Johnson, I'm, you're the only one who got that reference. Yeah. So on, like, my Instagram story, I had posted a quote from Jeremiah Johnson. And uh, usually I, I have, like, a decent amount of response to, like, those stories. And uh, ben was the only person yeah. who responded and got the reference, right? Yep. Uh, Jeremiah Johnson is one of like the my all-time favorite movies. I think it is the best. It's a classic. It's the best hunting movie there is. Yeah. Uh, and my boys have seen it. How how many times do you think uh, they've seen three, it? Just, probably. Yeah, they, they've yeah. seen it. They've seen it a bunch. And our interest in trapping it, uh, well, it actually emerged from. Me watching Jeremiah Johnson with my dad. I wonder how many people up. can say that too. Oh, it's you know, I mean, be. it has to have changed. I right? watched it with mine growing up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think Jeremiah Johnson had a similar impact on trapping, the way that. And this is a terrible crossover reference, and all of my trapper friends will cringe at this. But it had the kind of the same impact that. Uh, Brad Pitt had in the river runs through it, right? And oh, then all sure. these rich guys flocked out west to put on plaid and fly fish, which is like, that's the last thing I want to go do. But I think Jeremiah Johnson probably sure. had an impact. And so, uh, you know, as we got into, as we got into to hunting and, um, you know, eating wild game and that becoming like our diet, uh, trapping was a way to one not only live into that like childhood dream of being Jeremiah Johnson right but also it was a way that got us outside longer yeah uh, and extended like our outdoor season sure um, you know we we recently got into waterfowl hunting and have really enjoyed enjoyed that that keeps us out there but but trapping is something that you're able to fit into your schedule uh, even if you're super busy, because once you have your trap set, uh, as long as you have them within a decent range, uh, you can check them on your way to work. And usually you're trapping when it's cold outside. And so, you know, if you pull a beaver or a mink or muskrat or a raccoon out of a trap and throw it in the back of your truck, or if you're my brother, uh, his, uh, his Buick, uh, then you can, th then it's going to, it's going to be fine. Right. Yeah, and yeah. so, uh, so we kind of got the, down to that. We got into that in Florida, uh, and there was uh, kind of our adopted, uh, one of our adopted Florida grandmothers, uh, a woman named Ann Hosford Smith. Uh, I had just, um, she had said that she had had some coyote trouble on her property, and she was trapping coyote. And I'm like, well, Ann, could you teach me? And so here, uh, this this tiny little uh, Florida woman. She's like five foot tall. <laughs> yeah, she's she's five foot tall. She taught me how to trap coyote, and uh, you know there there's not a there's not a great beaver population in in Florida, and so we moved to Ohio, and I started researching the beaver population. Uh, you know, a hundred years ago, they were nearly non-existent yeah, in yeah. the state of Ohio, and it's really a, a conservation success story. 
And we made some connections out in Muskingum and Coshocton County with uh, some friends who had some private land who uh, were experiencing some trouble with, with beavers, uh, damming up streams and just wreaking havoc on, on their landscape. And so I had made a few friends that hooked us up with some Conibear 330s, some foothold traps. Uh, I had did a bunch of research, read a lot of books, and we just started trapping and we've, uh, we've had a lot of success with it. And, you know, a lot of people, they'll, they'll trap, especially beaver, uh, they'll trap beaver for, for its pelt, obviously, and that's what we were trapping for. Uh, but looking at, like, the first beaver that we trapped, uh, once we skinned it out and prepared it for uh, being sent off to tan, we looked at the meat and we're like, you know what? This meat looks too good to simply give to the dog. Yeah. And so we cooked it up. And it's delicious. It's absolutely delicious. What would you compare it to on like a like a meat scale? Yeah, like I think it tastes very similar to beef. Really? Mm-hmm. That's what I've heard. Yeah. It's very similar. Uh, it tastes like a roast beef the way we prepared it. Sure. Um, but... Yeah, we did like a like a beaver vegetable stew. Yeah, that'd be perfect with some cornbread. Yeah, perfect. And uh, I mean, it was abs- I'm getting hungry thinking. No doubt, it is lunchtime. And like trapping is really kind of again trapping. I think is a if you're think, thinking back to how to get kids involved in the outdoors. Oh, great way. trapping is perfect because there's almost that like. I mean, I get this feeling every time I yeah every time I go to check a trap, it's kind of like I'm coming downstairs on Christmas morning yeah, wondering no if there's something in that trap. And you know, I shared a video uh, a couple weeks back on my Instagram where my boys were with me and they're walking out on this frozen pond, and uh, you know, we had run through the they ice, call it ice skating. Yeah, they, they, they were on <laughs> we're ice skating. We're going ice skating. We ran them through like the safety measures and you hear my, my boys and they've still got like a remnant of their Southern accent. And they're like, daddy, we got a big one. He's a big boy. He's a big boy. And so they, they were involved that. in that process. And uh, so what we plan, we've got a bunch of uh, our basement has kind of turned into like our, uh, our fur shed. And so we've got a bunch of those hides there, that are, there you go. Is that, that are dry. That the one there? Th- that's, yeah, yeah, that's the one Thomas did. So he yeah. set that, uh, half his, half his eyes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thomas set that, uh, set that trap. Uh, he used, a uh, a trap setting mechanism on that 330 because those are, uh, those are lethal traps. I mean, it'll, it'll break your arm if you, if you get it, get it in there, but he set that trap, uh, made the set, put the bait in, uh, and then, you know, it was before school one morning. We're like, hey, buddy, uh, we're going to get up an extra hour early. We're going to go check the traps. And uh, then he went to school and he's like, Dad, I told all my friends that I was trapping beaver. And, uh, you know, he rattles off all their names and like, they want to come with us next time. Oh, so, sure. That's great. Uh, you know, so, so we, we love trapping. And I know Jackie's got plans for uh, some beaver mittens. And I'm very excited that for is some awesome. beaver mittens. <laughs> beaver mittens, yeah. I think Ronella's got something ice fishing right now where they did um, like a beaver mitten. Oh yeah, yeah, I think it was it was like a hat thing. They yeah. like passed the hat mm-hmm. around. I think it was oh, last yeah, year. They did something yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Well, and too, like uh, you know, not just with beaver, but I'm a big. Uh, I'm right now. It's kind of my thing, especially out there. I'm encouraging. They're out of season now, but I'm encouraging everybody if you can, you know, take fifty bucks, go to go to some sort of uh, you know like Rural King or Tractor Supply. And purchase some dog-proof traps to trap to trap raccoons, because like right now it's been my thing. I've been talking about a lot lately. Lot lately, it is the golden age of raccoons. Oh sure, They're because everywhere. there's there's no fur market for them. Yep. And so people aren't able to make any money off of them. And so I'm convinced that they're just wreaking havoc on our turkey population. And I'm a big turkey hunter, and uh, I think we need to be trapping more raccoons in order to help. Uh, you know, curb that population. Yeah, so. and we talked to Mark Wiley, the biologist for the state. Um, I had to pull up his credentials, but we we did talk to him on a previous episode about predation for the turkey nest and ground nesting birds and whatever have you. And that was a thing too that we discussed. You know, just you know, between the the coyotes, and the raccoons. Every, I, I always possum, joke the possum. I always yeah. I always laugh because people share memes of these possums of how how great they are. At all this other stuff. I'm like, well, as a hunter, I hate them. Yeah, because yeah. like. They're, they're, you know, they're ruining the clutches of these turkeys. And so yeah, yeah, a, flo- a flock of turkey are going to eat more because it's always the ticks, right? You don't, don't yep. kill a possum because yep. they eat ticks. Oh, sure. A flock of turkey are going to out the ticks of, of yes. a possum any day, right? Yep. 
I mean, if we were in the tick eating Super Bowl, the turkeys are going to win every time. Dude, well, how, not, how many did Mark say per nest? Six, roughly I'd seven. Have to go, I'd have to go back to listen to it. Yeah. yeah, I think it was like roughly six, seven birds per nest. If they can if, get fifty percent, I think it was a great, a yeah. great clutch. If they can get that many to hatch out yeah. and, and get through their juvenile period, mm-hmm. yeah, with success. And so that's coming back. We and the reason why we are we're asking it because obviously they changed the bag limit this year mm-hmm. to to kind of help. Right. We're talking right. Another, another great conservation story: the wild turkey population in the country. Oh, yeah. That's another great conversation. We could probably go on forever about that too. But no, that, and I'm glad you said the 50 bucks. So let's say I mean a live trap at Tractor Supply to go catch a raccoon. I can I can get behind that. But if I'm someone that like truly wants to get into it, I have a small pond at my house. I do have some muskrat dens there. I just the time. Someone like myself, what would your guys' opinion be to get started? What what would be like your checklist, if you will, for someone to get into trapping as just a hobby? Clearly, we're not making money on it right now, so it would be a, like an activity for the family. I would pretty much bet you, if you were to talk to some people that you know that um, are older and and used to hunt they'll probably have traps yeah. that they don't use anymore like and they'll give them cut. to you yeah. for free <laughs> yeah i mean that's that that's one thing is like there's a there's an entire generation of like old school trappers yeah. who feel as if they have a they have a distinct set of skills that nobody wants to learn yeah and i think in many ways they're just begging for somebody to continue it to, to continue yeah. it so Just so we ask them to show you what they know and they're so willing to yeah. teach you and then on the on the other hand they're also willing to to share some of the things that they have that maybe they don't use anymore sure oh yeah yeah i mean so so we've made we've made friends with folks that you know have ultimately like fully supplied us with all the traps we need to catch beaver mink muskrat raccoon coyote i mean you you name it yeah however if you don't have that community uh you know reach out to reach out to jackie and i because i love i absolutely love uh kind of sharing our lifestyle with folks sure Uh, and then too if you know if finding traps and affordable traps are a you know obviously they're a barrier to entry yeah uh, jump on Facebook Marketplace or go to garage eBay sales or, yeah. in the summertime because uh, especially if you hit those garage sales, yeah. uh, there's going to be folks who really have no idea what they have in you know like 110s, 220s, 330s, these different sizes of uh, body grip traps, and they just want to get rid of them because sure. they don't know they don't know what to do with them. And uh, you know, and then also another great resource is to um, you know to read up on it. I'm a big fan of you know researching. You know, most of the stuff we like Jackie and I we didn't have anyone. We had very few people teach us how to hunt and to fish and trap. A lot of it was just based on like reading books, and then of course you can Google and YouTube just about yeah, just about, uh, about, it, about everything. Yeah, and that's one thing I think it is kind of interesting too, as these these. Sl- Outdoor celebrities, if you will, and 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 by that I'm meaning, you know, the the Steve Rinellas of the world and the meat eater and how they're trying to bring people more of that connection to their food. It'd be interesting to see how that changes where trapping goes, because I mean, obviously everyone wants to go elk hunt, everyone wants to go shoot mule deer, but I think the cool thing about them is that they're bringing back the small game perspective. And what to to Ben and I, especially, and I'm sure you feel the same way. That's the true, like outdoorsman, like the small game, the rabbit the trapping, like that's the kind of stuff it's, it, you can do it with your family. It's easier, if you will, so at some points. The barrier entry is not as big. And so it'd be interesting to see how that industry kind of changes just a little bit with people like our age, if you will. Oh, well, and that's something I think we've got to recover is like taking pride in the local wildlife that are yeah. present in the ecosystems that we live in. Like, yeah, I mean, everybody wants to go out and do an elk hunt, but yeah. you know what? Like, that elk is just something that lives off in a land that you have no connection to, sure. right? And so the the woods that we hunt, I mean, I want to know every tree. I want to know the history of that land. I want to know the history of the people who used to inhabit that land, the story of the wildlife that are on those landscapes. And you know what? If, if I live the rest of my days doing nothing but uh, taking Muskingum County squirrel raccoon and uh you know mature does 
and, and you know, catfish out of the Muskingum River, I am going to die a very, very happy man. No doubt. Uh, and like, like, that's not to say that I wouldn't want to go, you know, on an elk hunt, right? Um, but that's why I keep uh, putting in for the Kentucky elk lottery, so I don't have to go too far. There you go. Uh, but, you know, and that's, and that's sure. one thing is my hope is that people would see that in hunting, in fishing, trapping, and, you know, growing your own food— we have an opportunity to connect to the land. Uh, and the land is what sustains us. The land is what has really gotten us to this point, right? It's only in recent history that hunting, fishing, and trapping has been something that's so foreign uh, to, the, to the vast amount of the American population. And I think when we begin to see that hunting, fishing, and trapping is an avenue in which we become connected with something that is greater than ourselves, something that will last longer than us, something that connects us to our ancestors and is there not to sell a product, sure. right? Yeah. Um, that's when we begin to see, like, you know what, hunting, fishing, conservation of these wild spaces that we live in, uh, that's something worth fighting for, you know, because, like, at the at the end of the day, like, the products that we use to get us out there uh, those are only going to get us so far, right? Um, you know, you can only buy so many, uh, so many new bows every year. Uh, what's going to keep you out there is the drive that you have to connect with something far greater than yourself, and that is your family and your family's connection to the land. I think sustainability is is another part that I think people kind of sometimes forget when they're talking about going big game hunting and sure. going out west. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's not cheap to do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for us, w- the reason we hunt is to provide for our family and to step outside of that and to go uh, on a, you know, a, a big, big game hunt somewhere would be awesome. Sure. But it doesn't really fall into line with, like, why we do it. And so, like, our purpose for doing it is to provide for our family and to get to know our land where we live and to get to know the, the, the place and the animals and, and everything that's in it. Um, but that's, it's so separate. Um, and so it, it's kind of – in my head, I've always felt like it's kind of counterintuitive to spend a bunch of money to go get the meat that I could just get out. Yeah, Yeah, it would be awesome. It would be great. But (laughs) like to say that I only would do that doesn't make any sense to me. No, I think it's more of an experience thing. Right. I think everyone, I mean, I know from, so I, I'm going to Wyoming this year for my first antelope hunt and it would be my first Western excursion period. But to me, your roots are still based in central Ohio. Yeah. You know what I mean? Ben and I say it all the time, get equally as jacked up to shoot a mature doe as I see a decent buck. You know, it, Cause that's what we're about. Yeah. And so yeah. I feel like you were the same way. Yeah. It, it's an experience. It's a, it's a vacation, if yes. you will. You know, it's, it's not. <laughs> the oh, way see, yeah. That, that's, that's a healthy perspective too. Yeah. Right. Because if you, if you view it as, you know, a uh, like a challenging vacation, yeah. I think it makes so much more sense, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, but we then were it just also, looking at that the other day. <laughs> we were just looking at it the other day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's like, if you look at, if you look at like my Instagram feed, you're going to see a lot of does on that feed because that's just what we're about is, yeah. uh, you know, is being connected to that land and, um, you know, letting those, those mature bucks, uh, grow to their potential. Uh, the, the tough thing about where we live is usually the bucks that we let pass, we see a week after, uh, laying dead on the side of the road. Yeah, for sure. And you're definitely, I mean, we joked about the, the area, but the area that you live is a very prominent whitetail spot within the state. Between oh, yeah, the game and Kashaka. It, it rank, it's top it's five top, every year. Yeah, no. every year. I think I just looked at the numbers this year and some the harvest rate there in Kashaka and Tuscarora and Muskingum County were by and large higher than most of the counties in the state. So. But that's all fake news. There's yep, no deer out there. <laughs> uh, it's, yes. ter- it's a terrible place to come and hunt. So where can people find you guys if they're interested more about your lifestyle or that's something that they're you know, they want to do for their own? Yeah, so Jackie and I we really don't you know, promote uh, ourselves in any way because there's nothing online that we have to, 
you know, to gain uh, because it's just kind of who we are and we like sharing that with folks and hopefully educating them. You'll see like on my Instagram, uh, usually with each post, I have a long winded uh, caption that tells you a little bit about uh, the history and my thoughts and connection with the land and uh, these animals that we love. But you can find me at uh, Dr. Dan Wells on Instagram. And that's just Dr. Dan Wells on Instagram. Uh, Jackie, she bakes cakes. And so if you're in the Dresden area, I'm plugging you, Jackie. Uh, if you're in the Dresden, <laughs> Ohio area, you can find her at Really Good Cakes. Yeah, we appreciate you guys having us. No, it's been great. I'm glad to have you in, and we'll definitely include all that in the in the notes and stuff below in the podcast. So. And before we wrap up completely, what was the kennel? Oh yeah, where you oh, guys yeah, got the kennel, uh, Crossfire Kennels. Uh, guy that runs that named uh, Mark Gouger. I think I'm pronouncing his his last name right, but he's in Whitwell, Tennessee. Uh, great folks. Uh, all, you can also look up the American Tree and Feist Association. Yeah. They're a great group that not only just provides incredible resources on how to train a squirrel dog and get you connected to regional hunts, but also is just doing great conservation work for those places that uh, they hunt. A lot of it is public land hunts, and that's where they hold most of their their squirrel hunting competitions. So check awesome. them out. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you making the drive today to come take, hang out with us. Thanks. It's been great. All right, everyone, that's all we have for you today. We hope you enjoyed that great conversation with Dan and Jackie. I know Ben and I could have went on for at least a couple more hours. As always, we appreciate you listening. Please give us a rating and be sure to share us with a friend. It helps us grow the show and continue to provide you with the best guests we can. And until next time, enjoy the pursuit.